Tonight, J.P. Morgan says 76 million households were affected by a security breach. Plus, Facebook's new guidelines for experimenting on users. And an unpatchable USB malware is on the loose. It's a great day on Tech News Tonight, and it's next. <laughs> this is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 185 for Thursday, October 2nd, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Citrix GoToAssist, the number one global market leader in remote support. Sign up for GoToAssist before October 10th and get another Citrix product free for six months. Visit GoToAssist.com and get started. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Another day, another massive security breach. Yeah, this is becoming commonplace. In a regulatory filing, J.P. Morgan Chase, which is the biggest bank in the U.S., says that a data breach affected 76 million households and 7 million small businesses and that customer names, addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses were all taken. A person briefed on the matter tells Bloomberg that internal data that identifies customers by category, for example, who might be a client of, of the private bank, was also obtained by hackers. The breach reportedly affected anybody who visited the company's website, like Chase.com, or even used its mobile app. The company also says that the data breach was previously disclosed and that, quote, there is no evidence that account information for such affected customers, account numbers, passwords, user IDs, dates of birth, or social security numbers was compromised during this attack. Although gigabytes of data were taken by hackers in the attack and the attack lasted over a period of months, that's according to people familiar with the incident, again telling Bloomberg that was back in August, and investigators in the case have tracked stolen files to a Russian data center. After Google's Sundar Pichai reportedly expressed interest in acquiring Cyanogen as part of Google's Android group, Cyanogen is reportedly seeking additional funding at a $1 billion valuation. Sort of like, hey, Google, we're worth more than that. This is according to a report today published by The Information. Cyanogen is the world's most popular Android custom ROM and has partnerships with companies like Oppo and OnePlus. And The Information claims that the company also has a deal with Indian Android phone manufacturer Micromax, which is a huge brand in India, to release a CM-powered handset as soon as the end of the year. So it could be actually directly competing with Google with Android One. And oh. A dozen celebrities whose iCloud accounts were hacked and whose nude photos were stolen in late August have hired attorney Marty Singer to represent them against... You thought I was going to say Apple. No, it's Google in a letter that threatened a $100 million lawsuit. Singer's letter calls out Google's despicable, reprehensible conduct and not only failing to act expeditiously and responsibly to remove the images, but in knowingly accommodating, facilitating, and perpetuating the unlawful conduct. He really sounds like a lawyer, doesn't he? Singer also claims that Google hasn't been expeditiously removing owned work from its platforms. That's in accordance with safe harbor provisions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, while other companies like Twitter have accommodated takedown demands. Remember Facebook's whole emotional manipulation research project that upset a lot of its users who claimed, hey, the company probably shouldn't be playing head games with us in our news feeds. Well, the company has set up new formal review process for pre-approving further research. Consent from users on experiments is actually already in Facebook's terms of service statement. So basically, by default, you are automatically agreeing to some form of experimentation just by being a Facebook member. But the company's new framework for internal and external research now has clearer guidelines. For example, if the research focuses on specific populations or demographics or is related to content the company calls considered deeply personal, such as emotions, the study will have to go through an enhanced review process before being pre-approved. A panel of senior researchers in different subject matters like privacy, legal, research, policy, and engineering will all determine if a study meets those guidelines. New engineers at Facebook will be trained during a six-week introductory boot camp on how research should be conducted and employees that already work at Facebook will also get education on proper research methods during annual security and privacy training sessions. All to 
toy with our emotions. Wow. Back when Apple introduced iOS 7, it also introduced a security feature called Activation Lock that prevents anybody from erasing or activating an iOS device before first entering an Apple ID and password. The feature has to be disabled before a device is passed on or sold to another person. And if you fail to do so, the device is unusable for the new owner. The company recently released a new tool that lets anybody check the activation lock status of iOS devices to make the process of checking for activation lock easier. This also prevents people from buying a device that might be locked because it was lost or stolen, or maybe because the previous owner just forgot to remove the device from their own account. So if you go to iCloud.com slash activation lock, you or anybody else can look up an iOS device if you've got the number. If the device is locked, a message will clarify that the current user's Apple ID and password are intact, and then you'll be required uh, to, to enter that before anybody can activate the phone. A little bit more helpful for theft purposes. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, is reporting today that a software program called Computer Cop that's designed to protect children online is actually spyware, which contains, among other things, a keylogger that could obviously place anybody's personal information at risk by transmitting whatever a user is typing over the internet to a third-party server without encryption. The EFF says that it conducted a security review of Computer Cop, plus public records of its involvement, see who was using it, and identified approximately 245 agencies in more than 35 states. That includes the U.S. Marshals that have used public funds to purchase and distribute Computer Cop, and that one sheriff's department even bought a copy for every family in its county. Well, that is unfortunate. Coming up, if you're tired of the kind of subtle click of the iOS keyboard, you've installed some third-party keyboards, get ready for some crazy new ideas. And up next, I will talk with Ian Thompson from The Register about why there's a publicly posted malware that affects USBs, and it's coming from researchers. But first, managing your company's IT support can be challenging. You've got various people with various needs, Maybe you've got mobile employees, people who are working remotely on a regular basis. Does that sound familiar to you? If so, we recommend Citrix Go to Assist. It is the number one global market leader in remote support. It's easy to use and it's cloud-based, so it's a remote support such, uh, solution that allows your IT team to solve problems as quickly as possible because that's always your goal, right? You got you got to be on top of it. If you sign up for Go to Assist, in fact, before October 10th, got eight days from now, you get another Citrix product of your choice, any of their suite of products of your choice for six months. Go to Assist Remote Support lets you provide live and, and unattended remote support to any computer, any mobile device. You've got screen share capability, so that's lets you fix support problems faster, more effectively. And you can use GoToAssist apps and easily deliver support anytime, anywhere. If you work in IT, you gotta try GoToAssist. It will make your job, your employees' jobs easier. You can sign up for GoToAssist today. And again, get that other Citrix tool free for six months. Citrix is a great company. It's got all sorts of stuff that will help you run your business much more effectively. Visit gotoassist.com and get started. Don't wait. Remember, the special offer expires on October 10th. Gotoassist.com, sign up today and receive your special offer. And thanks to Citrix for sponsoring this episode of TN2. Joining us now is Ian Thompson, tech news reporter over at The Register. Hey, Ian. Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon to you as well. I remember uh, last time we talked to you, you were uh, you were heading out to Vegas. It was a Indeed. it was a big couple of weeks in in internet security. Oh yes, and terrifying from a paranoia perspective yeah. as those kind of conferences usually are. But uh, a lot of interesting stuff there, and uh, quite a few surprises as well. Just very paranoid using the wireless network at the center. Well, you mentioned you know yeah, if you've got paranoia, it's it's kind of a weird conference to go to. In fact, two months ago at uh, at Black Hat, researcher Karsten Knoll explained bad USB, which is a way that malware malware can be introduced into the firmware of a USB device, which obviously can can cover a wide variety of devices. Now, he explained what was going on, but he didn't release the code. The code is now out in the wild, though. So what happened? Well, basically, last week, a couple of uh, security researchers were at another smaller security conference, and they'd basically taken uh, the bad USB work and expanded on this. And in fact, 
put some new features into into the software that you could do different things with the USB controller itself. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what they then did was release all that code on GitHub, which means it's available to anyone. Malware writers across the world can now get hold of this, and it's going to look. <sighs> It's going to look very, very bad if this starts to go white, if this starts to be used in the wild in a, in a big way. Okay, so I think a lot of people's first reaction would be, is that just like a terrible thing to do? Is this like trolling security of the world? Or is this really the only way to put enough pressure on device manufacturers to make sure that they produce products that aren't vulnerable this way? Well, this has been one of the big debates in the security research industry for the last 10 years. We have a thing called responsible disclosure, which means if you do find a major flaw with a software program, you get in contact with the manufacturer and you don't release that news until the patch is out. That way you minimize the effect for malware writers to do it. Now, the argument that these guys have used is that obviously USB manufacturers aren't taking this seriously enough and therefore the only solution is to make everyone vulnerable and force them to act on that, which is one argument, but at the same time that still leaves an enormous body of USB devices out there which could now be vulnerable and which, let's face it, 99.9% .9 of the population hasn't got a clue how to make safe in the first place. I think it's a personally a very irresponsible move. Okay, well, what are the other options if, 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 if I'm potentially using devices that are uh, susceptible to some sort of attack, I've got, I've got malware in my machines, what, what would be another course of action that would be more responsible as, as somebody who, who understands how this works? Because like you mentioned, a lot of people in the public just don't even know what's going on. No, I mean, a lot of serious security researchers aren't, aren't, aren't entirely sure what's going to come down the line. Uh, I don't think we're going to see an immediate flood of malware aimed at USB devices. It's still fairly tricky to implement. Um, what I do think you're going to see is with more general malware builds that infect everyone's computers around the world, you might see this being added in as like an extra function in the toolkit or a blade in the Swiss Army knife, as it were. Um, I think this might move manufacturers to, to sort of take security slightly more seriously, but you're dealing with companies who are in the volume business of just building USB microcontrollers. They're really not that interested in security, and I think Honestly, it's going to take a, a big malware outbreak to actually get them to shift on this. In the meantime, people are now much more vulnerable than they were in the past because this code has been put on the wild with really no controls as to who can download it. I mean, I'd have slightly more sympathy with them if they'd said, right, we've put it on online. If you are a valid security researcher and you've got credentials you can prove, we will give you the code. But simply just putting it out there on GitHub, I, I really do feel is a, is a very wrong faced move. So what happens now uh, to anybody who might be listening to this and say, well, I, I have USB devices. What, what do I do? How do I protect myself? Well, the, I mean, first thing is not to panic. There's no, <laughs> there's no sign of this in the wild as yet. And when it does start occurring in the wild, we're going to start hearing about it pretty quickly because a lot of people are looking out for it. So at the moment, basically, you know, keep calm, don't panic, carry <laughs> on as normal. But just keep an eye on the news. If you do hear anything about this, we will be amongst the first to report it. And then at some point, once we get an outbreak, then either um, companies will be putting out patches as fast as they possibly can, or antiviral engines are going to find a way around it. Um, I don't think we're looking at the 10 billion USB devices out there all having to be junked in the next couple of days. But potentially the threat landscape has got an awful lot more scary. Ian Thompson reports over at the Register. Thanks so much for shining a little light on what could potentially be quite a nightmare for many of us. Uh, thanks, Ian, and let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Um, you can always get us on theregister.co.uk. Thanks so much. Have a good day. I'll see you at the next security big breach. Oh, they're always good for Won't take long, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on now. You know how Apple allows people to install third-party keyboards uh, for the first time, really, in iOS 8? Very exciting. If you go into the App Store, there are a lot of third-party keyboards now. How about a keyboard, though, designed to sound like, oh, I don't know, Jack Nicholson in The Shining? Doesn't that sound terrifying? The app is called Keysonic. It was actually created from a company called Desonic. They have some experience with sound effects. They did some sound effects for the first Bioshock game. Now, this app comes with six free sound sets, but there's, of course, an in-app purchase option to buy 21 others. One of those sounds a little bit like an electric guitar. <laughs> 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 
And if that is not obnoxious enough for you, there's one uh, entirely of fart noises. Uh, if you want to upgrade uh, 99 cents, you can buy the one that's uh, highlighting Jack Nicholson. It's not just Jack Nicholson. It's him laughing in the movie The Shining. So, you know, it's really, really quite unnerving. Another is called Restricted Access. It's supposed to sound like a security key ba- pad or even something called Creepy Circus, which plays the sound of a clown being hurt when you hit the E key on your keyboard. I don't know if the clown's supposed to be being hurt. It's just a really obnoxious sound. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Please do write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.